the code here to the the YouTube video. It, I still think it's good. Like if you want a nice primer, at least goes into a good number of detail for the Tensor QTL. Uh, in more detail than I have written in the tutorial I wrote. So yeah, if you want to get to know the nitty gritties and then she's got some helper scripts that I added here as well, just links that are already there. So I, I suggest like, you know, before you do any, if you want to, if you're really new to it, you want to get like a fill, go ahead and rewatch this video. It's not, there have been some changes um, so the interaction EQTLs, which I, I don't really have time to talk about now, that's no longer series data. It's if you're on version 0, 1.0.7 0 .0 or higher, they now can do categorical. So it moved from a uh, series to uh, a data frame. Uh, and if you are on the latest version, which I am not, they have added more functionality for trans EQTL analysis, and they've also changed some of the headers. Uh, so you'll have to be very careful if you're using the 1.0.8, but I don't think that we have that on the cluster yet as a module. So if you're working with 1.0.7, you're gonna be good. Uh, and then I, I also added the links where you can actually go to their master tree uh, and see their version of the tutorial. I, I have to admit, most of this stuff is still quite like backdated. Some of it is, it's not uh, like, they don't update it as much as you would like. Uh, but if you can, if you're familiar with Python and you can read the scripts and you can get more familiar with what they have, that they don't have in their own like examples and tutorials, including Suzy R, which is in fine mapping. They've ported that from R into here so that you can use it with GPU base. Uh, I see there's Coloc. I have actually not used that yet. Uh, and then they added the IGNMT for the interaction EQTLs and, and stuff like that. So. And then I added these links to their tutorials, which are still a little older. Some of them are using fast EQTL and not tensor EQTL, but I thought it's still good to have these links in the course to look at their paper and to see this pipeline uh, that they use with the the EQ their the GTEx consortium. It has still a lot of like good information even if some of it is a little older and it has some helper scripts that I've I've used and adapted uh, to work with our data as well, if you wanna go to the source. And then I found this nice kind of, uh, from uh, uh, Ames Lab, this kind of walkthrough on like, if you want to install this in an Anaconda environment, it's already on the cluster, but if it's not working and you want to install it, you need to make sure you install it correctly with uh, GPU enabled. So I like that there is this here to help making sure you have these things like the RPI2, uh, which is like, you can't run it without it. And then I also saw that they had uh, a tutorial as well, the same lab where they also go through some of the basic things, although Luis covered pretty much all of this stuff in that video. So if you just wanna read it instead of watching the video and hearing me interrupt every five minutes, um, th this I thought this was useful. Okay, so with the background out of the way, I had this markdown file here, uh, well, it's both Markdown and org mode, which will go through, pretty much goes through so a little bit of background in EQTL analysis, why we're still doing it. And then it gets into the the real, like, let's do this with our data and walking it through. So pretty much, I think what is like essential here is knowing what kind of data you have and what you would like and it looks like there's a, a small error in my code, but 
we'll pretend like it's not there. Hmm. It didn't fix it. So e either way, I, I just had links to the accounts and the uh, the data that we can use that's available uh, so that you could just, and, and the references so that you, so you could just um, upload it yourself. Uh, one of the things that I, I like to think about when I'm doing EQTL analysis is what your study design is. You can do the traditional sys EQTL analysis where what you really want is a nice large sample size, uh, but it, also, you need to think about if you're doing an interaction EQTL analysis versus a trans EQTL analysis, uh, because those will need different steps. And you really start with this by planning out how many samples you have and what the model you're going to use, because that will tell you what additional files you may or may not use. For this, I'm just going to talk about doing something very standard with a sys EQTL. So we want mostly just as many samples as possible. So for you know the brain seek, which has you know neuros neuropsychiatric disorders, uh, and we're going to keep everything, whether it's neurotypical control or not, because that's not going to affect our our overall uh, effect sizes when we're done. And so here, I just want to make sure I'm in the right place. You can clone this repository. It's, if you do it on the cluster, then I can share you the input data and stuff. But the, then you can just link to the, the uh, genotypes for us. But since some of it's protected, really, there's just scripts here. But most of this here is like you can just download the, the R variable we have and then uh, select out the fields that are, are used in the phenotype data. Uh, and then once you have that, I filter because again, the study design is adults and we want to limit uh, our, our, the differences in population structures and just save the file. And so File key files you have to have phenotype data. You need to have normalized counts. You need to have genotypes, uh, and then covariates. But you can make covariates if you have phenotype data and you have genotype and expression. And so, using our variable, what we want to do is kind of mimic what was going on in the authors, uh, the tensor EQTL and the fast EQTL authors. And what they actually use is they use this normalizing factor using TMM. What they do is they port this from R to Python. So if you wanted to use the helper scripts that were I showed you in that like the GTEx pipeline, you would have to then output text files of counts in some type of TPM is what they norm they use, or you could theoretically edit it a little for something else and then use their scripts to then get what this one line of code can do in R. Since our variables are already in R, I decided that for now we could just keep it there and then just do the same cleanup and putting it into that kind of edge R variable, making sure all the files are the same with like the Libra kind of data and then do a filtering step. This can be anything. It can be what you know the Jappy Lab use, where they look at everything and then they select some to filter out. I prefer to just you know do a space model and then put it into filter by expression since it's faster. Uh, and then and I don't have to look at it. And then just apply this norm calculation. And after that, they just it's a simple using CPM. And that's all done in like some helper scripts and stuff that I've, I've included. Uh, but for here, it's it's pretty simple to 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 add. And then you just outlined your your data. You're pretty much golden at this point. So you've got phenotypes, and now you have expression counts. So you don't have to download, convert from these R variables the raw counts. You can just get use these uh, normalized expression counts. And um, from here, normalized expression counts. 
This next section here is a gene annotation. Luis talks about it like near the end of the of the, the video, how you have this chromosome start site and it, a pseudo insight. The insight is actually not so necessary. They, they want it there. But if you were to look in the actual scripts, they automatically do start plus one. Um, but it does give you this nice bed format. So essentially what you're doing is you're just going to grab the bed format. And because we're using those summarized range experiment, it, it's very simple to do in R. And so that's pretty much what I just did. I copied the genes that we filtered earlier in the se session. And I'm grabbing the annotation from the row ranges and just reorganizing it into a bed format. Uh, so, yes, it, okay. So, it pretty much just filtering it, selecting and organizing the the chromosome start set, giving that gene name, ID, because theoretically you don't have to do this in genes. It's like we, especially the the process data that's available from the the brain psychic, the brain seek has genes, transcripts, exons, junctions. They're all in this range, row range summary thing. So you can theoretically do the exact same thing where you're replacing this as the unique feature ID and then adding some other variable for annotation that has that known gene ID or the gene symbol for you can go backwards. So theoretically, and I, I mean, not theoretically, I've done it. This can port and all you're doing is switching out this variable and you can have that same exact annotation file, this bed style annotation file that you can then use to clean up that data. So that's in that that format that Tensor EQTL wants to see. Okay. Um, so, is there any reason why you didn't use um, the function export from our track later? The what function? Uh, export from our track later. Because I don't know it. <laughs> yeah. No, I would love for, if you, let me write that down so I can put in a request <laughs> for another R Stats Club to you export. Because I, 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 yeah, I found the row ranges by accident. And then I just did a bunch of all this stuff. But it sounds like that might be like a one-line code. So, I'll just send you a pull request to uh, fix the table format. Thanks. A bit of confusion here about the bed format. The bed input for tensor QTL, as far as I know, it's a different type of. This is just an annotation bed as UCSC bed format, right? But yeah. it's not really an input for tensor QTL, is it? The bed I is use it for a prep file. So, like, the first thing I'm doing here is like, prepping the data and then the next step is a pre-process and then finally we're using the tensor eqtl file so this is like step one of three uh, i like having this annotation file because i can add gene symbols i can add the gene id especially if i'm doing something like junctions or transcripts and then i can go back to annotate the eqtls and it makes it a little bit easier to have that file on hand than having to recreate it every time. But also I use it to make the corrected format that Tensor EQTL is expecting. But yeah. So just save that. Yeah. Any question? Um, okay, so KJ, I had a comment about the strand. I see that you're exporting it here, and then I didn't. And then I changed that. I actually had to make to my code. Um, was like, <clears throat> sorry, I lost my voice a little. But um, that like for strand negative genes, you have to use the end instead of the start. So like, I don't know if the updated version is like now considering that because I had to go back and like manually fix that. For the strand negative genes. <clears throat> yeah, so like you have to use the end at location as the transcriptional start site rather than the start. 
So that was like a mistake that I had previously in my script was I was just using the start for every gene without considering the strand. Um, and that I had to fix that. So I, I noticed that you're exporting the strand there and not swapping this. So I wonder like, is the new, is the update like considering that and making that easier for us? Or It's been a minute since I read the code to see if it fixed that error. So I mean, I'll it's have, not really an error on their I'll, part. It was just like one more step for, you know, uh, fixing your input. I mean, it, it's technically an error. If you have to swap okay. strands for the start and the end point instead of knowing, I'll look. Okay, it's yeah, because my, I guess like for the genotype, what is it? it? They call it like the phenotype location or like file, right? Like, yes. That's like, um, that was something I had to fix to make like the results accurate. Um, hi, hi everyone. Yeah. I think that this line of code is in another file, like you know. I've been. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Hi. Um. So yeah, I had the same problem actually, and I get. I mean, I was crazy about that, and I think that you can find it in a prepare bed file, in the subfolders. But anyway, in their in their files. Yeah, I, I remember the same. So that they use. Okay. Okay. And when the strand is negative and the start plus one, when the strand is positive, I think. So yeah. It, what is it? The EQTL prepare bed. Yeah, I think so. If I remember. Okay, so I I adapt that file for when I do oh. this bit. Okay. Um, but I'll have to double check to make sure my that the modified one is is correct. Yeah. Prepare expression, the prepared ask bed. They had a, this is the adapted one, which was the EQTL prepare expression where they think they end up flipping stuff. But I have to double check because I I've cleaned up the code to re remove some of the Update some of the stuff and remove some of the stuff. If you've ever had to use Feather, that's so outdated, the Pi Arrow messes up that you should delete that and then just in update your Pandas because Pandas now can import Feather. So if you're needed to fix that, that that's like a, a, a small caveat, but. Okay. Yeah, so for for now, the EQTL ex prepare bed probably fixes that. Okay. Uh, but but for here, I, I have I I don't bother doing that manually. Okay, gotcha. That's I mean, this seems more convenient and like less confusing for people who are looking at that output. Then, um, yeah. So hopefully, that's like this seems better than what I had previously done. So. I'm going to double check to see if the helper function that I add here, because I added a bunch of scripts in the script to, so that people can edit and work with it. Own okay. And, and I'll update it as necessary. Now, the genotype data, it doesn't really like VCF files. However, they do have some helper files functions within the genotype IO uh, script to import VCF. I have not tried it, but I see that it is there. You can do Plank, and the new versions have updated it so that you can also do the Plank 2 PG, PGN uh, formatting format. So it doesn't have to be just bed. For now, I'm using bed because I like to have the FAM data, but it can be easily adapted to, to the Plank 2 format. And, this is just getting the population structure. It's very, like, this is like standard. So I have it here because I was going to, because I, I did it, but then it doesn't quite I export for, the shell stuff doesn't export as well as R and Python. Uh, and then this one always takes forever. So I, I just copied earlier. And just if you wanted to see, I made sure to, to have some sessions information. And that was the the first step where we're just getting that genotype data, uh, expression data, 
and phenotype information. I didn't even bother doing the covariates at the first step because I we can do it on the fly. And I find that doing it on the fly reduces um, intermediate files. Uh, so for that pre-processing the stuff, the stuff that's actually going to go into that tensor EQTL code, uh, this is like that next bit where you have sample selection and the GCT formatting. And here, what we really want to make sure is we get a list that has both the RNA, the expression IDs, and the genotype IDs, the samples that we're actually using, and making sure that they have genotypes. And then the chromosomes to assess. We're, we're doing all of them plus the X chromosome, but some people skip the X chromosome or just have a handful they want to do. And, and then adding some, some header formatting so that it works well with that EQTL prep bed format expression script. And so that's what this helper script is in, pretty much does all of that. Here, I've just gone walk through it step by step of what the script does. This first one here is just adding uh, a little bit of description so that it's in that GCT, GCT format. It doesn't do anything else. It's literally just cop, uh, concatenating on a couple of strings, accommodated strings, no less. And this next bit is here is where we're doing all that checking that I mentioned, making sure we have the correct samples that we want, that they have genotypes, and then making that mapping list and I do things in Python. You can technically do all of this in R, but I start with Python first. So just reading that phenotype data, we exported earlier. And then getting, this is why I like the fan because I already know exactly what it looks like. Um, and here I wanted to make sure I got the, the brain ID uh, and it's expecting the brain ID to be in the, the genotype ID to be in this column. Uh, so if it's not, you will have to like do some editing. Um, and this is for the tensor EQTL portion. They really do expect your IDs and your Plank files to be in the IID fi uh, file. Right? So here is just making sure that phenotype data and the sample data, they match so that we don't have... Uh, if you had made uh, expression data of like every sample you had, then making sure that you have the correct samples and that they are in the same order, which comes into play, you really need to have it all in the same order, which we already explained in the video. Otherwise, it messes it up. It's the same for FASTQ, uh, QTL as well. And then here is that sample selection. The only thing here is that I like to output this keep file so that we can edit the plank files so that we have the correct genotypes in the correct order. So say you have outputted your VCF and it's got all 2000 of the brain seek brains, you only wanna do the 400 or something that's part of the COD-8. Making sure you have this keep file, uh, keep fam file makes it easier to subset the big data for the genotypes you want in the correct order. Uh, so you don't get an error. A and then I just output the mapping file. Uh, this is here is where you would add another kind of line of code if you also wanted to do some type of interaction uh, EQTL analysis. Uh, but for time, I I'm just going to skip that. And if you're really interested, I can go over it. And there's I've got scripts for different projects that already have have that in there that we could review. And so essentially what you're exporting is that normalized expression into that GCT format. And you're making sure that the, the uh, genotypes match. Specifically, they match the genotypes, which is why we loaded in the FAM data. And then you're exporting that out. And then I, I have this small file that's used in that EQTL 
prepared BAM bed file that tells it which chromosomes to look in, pretty much all of them. By pretty much, it is all of them. <laughs> okay, and then this is just a little bit helpful to, to follow. And then the last thing, um, not the last thing, the next thing is the genotype formatting. I was mentioning how we exported that FAM data so that we can subset the genotypes. And uh, I've, this is not gonna be available on Git, obviously, but uh, you can get access if you go through all the, the, the thing, but everybody here should have access. Now, here's what we were talking about a little earlier about like the expression formatting. And here's like the original script from that you can get from from the the GTEx pipeline, and I'm guessing this is probably where the flipping happens. Uh, but I, I don't remember where that would be at, so I'm I'm not gonna go through this whole thing for it. But I did want to make sure we had that linked in here in multiple places, and then the workflow which I also have linked here, and for here it pretty much takes in your normalized counts. I've added the bed file. Uh, previously, if you're using that, this original one, what they want is a GTF uh, file. And that works for genes and it can work for transcripts and exons. It doesn't work for junctions, which is why I've, I've edited it to use the bed file instead. Um, and literally, the difference is, is if you, whether or not you want to use do junction junctions. Otherwise, you can get away with doing their help uh, help file instead. And as long as this thing, although this one looks like a, a pretty much a older version of that that file. And then uh, once you're done you can kind of look at it. it, it gets you a, this one creates a compressed file. So it uses the SAM tools, uh, BCF tools, I think to, no, BG something to, to BG zip, to zip the file in an index way, and then Tabex to index the file. Uh, I'm still not 100% sure if they need the indexed file, uh, but I always do it just in case, since it's better to have the index file than to not have the index file. And then it just names it something, and I always name it genes something something. Uh, and then the, I think the last thing you you need is the covariates. And so I'm doing this on the fly instead of uh, doing the covariate somewhere else and then loading it and subsetting it. Uh, so this is pretty similar to a lot of our, our function stuff that we've done before where you get the, you're loading in that counts matrix, you're uh, filtering out some of the low expressing reads, pretty much what that's here and then getting a normalized data so that you can do PCA on it. And then the PCA uh, is doing that with a model that includes population structure. So that's where I've added population structure uh, here. PCA and then your final model will have the population structure and then uh, how many PCs, expression PCs to get calculated from here, and then you just do that whole thing, add them together, concatenate them together. And then the only real difference here is making sure you have the right samples in the correct order. And so that's what that, that sample mapping list where it has the expression IDs on one side and the brain IDs on another. And from there, you're adding them together, concatenating them so it's in an order and then flipping them because this is the the style that it likes and it's in the order that you need it to be in. Oh. <laughs> so that's the first part, making sure you have input data. The second part, making sure everything 
is in the correct format. And now we can actually run TensorQTL. I think this is the simplest bit here because you're just processing stuff and it doesn't take much time uh, to do. Uh, and now once you're done with that, you can log into CUDA. And again, I was talking about the versions and making sure PyTorch is installed appropriately. And so when I was testing this out earlier, uh, this was available and I just do it by hand. Uh, what shell script is, is not. So you're loading everything in. Uh, one thing I will note, you do not need to load in PyTorch. Um, it, when you load in uh, Tensor EQTL, the functions require PyTorch. So you have to have it installed, but you don't have to load it in. Uh, what you do need to make sure is that you have the correct R and a R loaded into the background so that it can use the functions, the R to func, and that you have R Pi 2 correctly installed. So I use a very specific Python version to make sure that it's installed. Uh, just this can, it's not very straight, it's not as straightforward as you like. So this just, as long as that's done correctly, then this is going to work out fine. If it's not, then spend more time making sure you've got R, R Pi 2 uh, configured correctly, and then it should work. I think, though, that the module, the Tensor QTL module, already has all everything nice and together. Uh, so you might not have to worry about any of that. Uh, yeah, we do. The and then, yeah, we, we just got the um, 1.0.8 as well installed recently. with And yet all the R Pi 2 and R and all the that confusing stuff is set up. That's good. That's good. Um, the, so, so if you're on the cluster, just load that in. I have some trouble with loading them, but as long as you don't have trouble, I would recommend using that. And then you can just load in some basic stuff uh, to, to read in the phenotype, genotype, and to run. Like the heavy hitter is the sys module. Uh, so I, I, obviously I like to use functions. So what we're pretty much doing is you're loading in the genotypes, you're using this Plank reader because of we're using, uh, Plank and then you're getting the variants and then just exporting them both so that you can export it once in one line. It doesn't take much time, like a minute or two to run and then I mean, when I, I'll put it in here, this is what it looked like. Uh, 300 and 435 samples and what is that? 7 million SNPs. And then the variant. And the same thing with the covariates. The only difference is even though they have us load it in that format here, we end up loading it transposing it before you put it in. So even though it had that IDs and we we spent all that time to make sure it looked like this, you actually end up transposing it before it goes in. If you're doing this in Python versus if you're doing it on the command line. Uh, and then the phenotype thing, it's pretty simple. You're just using that one function to get both that phenotype and then the positions. And then once you have the phenotype and the positions, then you're you're good to go. So I, I went ahead and just kind of looked, uh, outputted what each of these major function is, especially the nominal mapping. So you can see everything it uses, all the defaults, the loggers. Uh, a lot of this here is for interaction EQTLs. So like if you're doing this using IGMT uh, is there and the interaction stuff and the interaction data frame instead of the series as I was mentioned. Uh, but we're, we're not doing that. We're just gonna do a regular one and put it in the output. So you just put everything in here. 
uh, and I modified the window because a lot of the time we're using 0 0.5 megabytes and then the math uh, 0 0.1. And this is the whole genotypes and it took uh, less than five minutes to run. Oh, it seems to have ran into the issue of of being over. So does not like me. Okay. Yeah. You want a screen share? I'm sorry? You want a screen share? Uh no, 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 it's okay. I just I how are you doing? I I'm gonna switch the screen share. <laughs> <laughs> it's not as nice as the um the the GitHub, uh, but this is actually what I was writing everything in. So we were at mapping. So the only thing I wanted to highlight is that when it was all said and done, it had took in the whole genotype three minutes and 3.23 minutes total, okay? Uh, in the example that Louise did, she did chromosome 18 in 0 0.07 minutes and like the wall clock and stuff turned out to be longer. But just the computation in the six for genes, all of the genes, nominal analysis, three, less than five minutes. And that's one brain region. You could imagine doing four brain regions on four separate GPUs. This is it's literally can do this in like um, less than 30, like five, five minutes. Okay. okay. What can I say? Five minutes is just great. Uh, and then they are in per, per parquet. So just a different type of uh, uh, compression file. Each individual. Uh, line. This is all nice and good. What we really care about is then doing permutation analysis. Uh, is the empirical uh, p value determination, and this one uses the sit mapsis. This is not as easy to look at, but essentially you have the same inputs. Uh, the only difference is you cannot do this with interaction QTLs, so you won't see any of the interaction QTL uh, functions. And then you can, although I don't know why you would, you can increase the in permutations, uh, or you can decrease it if that's actually what you want to do. And then tell it to break tiebreakers, random tiebreaker. I, I leave that as a default, as, as false. And then I always seed it. Um, so that it's reproducible, but I think it has a, a, a seeded, you can see the instructions also seeded, you'll see that. This one takes longer. Uh, I think this ran about 40 minutes last night, but still, if you add this two together, you've done nominal mapping and then you've done permutation and mapping for genes in one brain region on one GPU, maybe that takes an hour. Uh, and if you've done it in parallel, where you've done four uh, GPUs, you've done all of the genes with permutation analysis, you're pretty much done uh, with EQTL analysis in an hour, hour and a half. Maybe you, you don't have your own four nodes. Maybe it takes two hours. But essentially, it's fantastic. Now, just as a reminder, this permutation analysis is going to give you an E gene, so one SNP per gene. So you can see that the total number of SNP uh, genes tested is like 22,000. And what you'll want to do and is in all the tutorials is to test for multiple corrections with the Q value. And here we're just using the Cal EQTL stuff. And this is pretty simple. You can tell it what the FDR is. I don't normally do anything else, but you do need to have that cis EQTL analysis, the permutation version loaded in. 
and before you add it. And this is where you'll F up if you don't have R installed, because uh, then it'll be like, oh, we can't do this because it's communicating with R. And it doesn't take much time at all. I think it, it ran in a couple of minutes. Uh, and then it gives you kind of this nice output on like how many of the EPTLs. We've got more than 400, so like more than half, about half are coming up as EPTLs. And then it gives the threshold, which is the p-value threshold. This is the important, important kind of number here because you can use that to get all of your significant associations. Uh, and that's what I'm calling post hoc here. So you've done everything, you've you've done all of that. What you then can load in, if you use their post and thing, you can get all significant pairs. So you're just in one script, you don't have to do anything extra. You can load in the data we just outputted, which is that permutation EQTL, and then at add that and the location of the nominal files. And that will give you all the significant associations. And when we're looking at that, there's significantly more of that. There's like 1.7 million. And here's just like an idea, like a, a, like a little bit of a touch of what it will look like. Have all the nominate nominal p-value threshold my thresholding here, what that minimum p-value is, and then you have all the associations. I like to use this data frame for like fine mapping or conditional stuff, mostly for fine mapping um, because you don't have to have everything. Uh, I, I don't have time to go into that much detail. I was very hoping that I would get to the conditional and the fine mapping, uh, but I only managed to get to the conditional stuff. This is, there's some nice code on all of those kinds of little resources that I shared. And this is pretty much the same, same kind of threshold where you have your genotypes, your variants, an input you, you will have is that permutation input because it's using the information, the Q value, things that are significant, that threshold to do the test and, and I, Luis goes into much better detail on what the independent and how they're using uh, the uh, the Q value versus the independent in that video. But this is just saying, okay, this is the function can do. And roughly, I think it took 40 minutes or so. Oh no, it took 81 minutes to run. I find this is the step that takes the longest. If you had it in your, in your script as an automation, uh, if you skip it, it's not that bad. And then I don't think I've done this yet. So let me, and then this will output how much is, is in the, the file. So it has a little bit more, it's getting more SNPs than your, the permutation, uh, but they're all should have some type of like significant association. And then this will give you that nice output where you've got the SNPs and uh, the beta uh, and, and the rank as well. I have found when I'm comparing uh, the conditional independent EQTLs e with a Suzy R's fine mapping, you will see the, the high pit in the Suzy R fine mapping overlap very well with the cis, the, the independent one. Uh, just as like, if you're wondering. Oh, 